So without any further ado, <coughs> I am going to thank you all and open up the discussion to Jerry Stokes from Brookhaven National Laboratory. Jerry uh, was originally an astrophysicist. You got your degree from the University of Chicago, if I recall. Yep. And uh, now he's at, after working at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab for many years, he moved to Tokyo for four years and has now moved to uh, Brookhaven National Laboratories. So Jerry, here you go. All righty. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I came here about four years ago and gave a presentation that I entitled, Now for the Hard Part. Uh, the thrust of that conversation was, as Paul's pointed out, the clear and present danger to the climate system from the combustion of fossil fuels while ignored for um, quite some time here in the U.S. Uh, was leading to a situation where we more or less needed to get started. We needed to understand what implementation was all about. And uh, um, the only thing that's really happened in this country in the last four years is we've made it harder because we basically continue to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. My primary point today is to talk about the nature of that implementation. And during that talk four years ago, I made the point that regional implementation is, in fact, at the heart of this. So let me start right off with what's going on in New York State. Last August, uh, Governor Patterson issued an executive order that called for a 80% reduction of carbon emissions in the state of New York by 2050 and established a council that was to put together a climate action plan. That process is ongoing right now. And with the expectation that it will be completed by the end of September of this year. Um, greenhouse mitigation is, is an important part of state planning. There are 31 states that actually have climate uh, action plans right now. Uh, you can go to the uh, uh, Climate Strategies website and you can see what the degree of those. New York is uh, one of the four that's got a continuing uh, role. I think this is important because I think historically and even continuing now, uh, oh cool, there we go. Um, the states are in fact the place of, of environmental leadership. And ultimately, um, whether the national policy exists or not, uh, the states will bear the brunt of, of, uh, of the economic consequences, they'll be the ones that'll be putting the policies in, state, in place. So watching the states is really the harbinger of the future of, let's see, this one's going to go. I have to, now I can do that? My keyboard cannot be identified. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. All right, we'll see how this goes now. Um, so the, this point about regionality is extremely important. I've listed a long set of elements in here. Basically, energy demand is driven regionally. Uh, economic influences, the interest in taxes, the interest in jobs. Renewable energy is a regional resource, as is carbon dioxide storage capacity. Other externalities are as well. Uh, policies that are trying to uh, uh, promote both economic and uh, other environmental aspects. Offsets like terrestrial sequestration are regional. Limiting resources like water are regional. And impacts, the concern driven by impacts is also regional. And of course, we all know about the locality of politics. Uh, this, is a, this is a volume that was put together um, now it's almost 15 years ago. We, at the, at the uh, group that I managed in Washington, D.C., put together a four-volume compendium on the possible role of social sciences in addressing climate change. It makes interesting reading, but uh, they put out a little companion piece for those that weren't willing to go through the four volumes. And I've highlighted a couple of things here. But as we go forward, I'm going to kind of emphasize this recognizing the limits to, uh, uh, to rational planning. Uh, several of the economists on, on, on our staff in Washington pointed out that until we actually have a price, until we really start trying to implement, we really don't know what the 
changes in technology and the kind of innovations that take place. The poster child for this is the Clean Air Act, which everyone thought was going to lead to uh, sulfur scrubbers on all the major power plants in the United States. And rather than using 20th century technology to deal with the problem, they used 19th century technology and put large railroad lines in place and moved low sulfur coal out of Wyoming to coal fire power plants that were actually at the mouths of individual um, uh, coal mines in the Midwest. So uh, until you have a policy and something that forces, it's very difficult to understand how, in fact, the market and how the industry is going to do. So typically, the process of, of putting together mitigation scenarios is a long list of scenarios, population, GDP per capita, uh, estimating the energy demand and activity that generates those things, construct supplies, build a business as usual sort of scenario, and then create policies and approaches that change that. And uh, to say that the result of that is complicated is, is uh, is an understatement. These are a wide variety of scenarios of global carbon emissions under a variety of underlying assumptions, just trying to get a business as usual. Everyone who believes that we are already on a path to save ourselves to those that see that we're on a path to catastrophe. So this, this standard approach, I think, reflects the limits of, of rational planning. And so what's happened over time is a variety of approaches have come forward. One of the alternatives is to focus on near-term cuts. This is actually the basis of the Kyoto Protocol. It's a targets and timetable approach. Uh, Kyoto was locked into this by what's called the Berlin Mandate. Uh, it does support early action as a demonstration of good faith, which was the argument that was made at the time. And I think more importantly, by not ratifying the Kyoto Protocol here in the United States, I think we lost an opportunity for creating learning about how, in fact, how hard this is, how difficult it is, and what the real challenges are. And also, I think the near-term focus doesn't really allow for the long-term technological um, view that speaks to things like uh, infrastructure and facilities that have a capital lifetime of 50 years or more. So a sort, scenarios are valuable. It does help you think about the problem. It, they're not predictions. And I think we have to recognize that the task ahead is, in fact, a long-term task. This is not something we're going to solve on Wednesday. Uh, so, uh, and certainly the goals are set for times well beyond any, uh, any kind of credible prediction. And I say this in, in complete deference to my colleague Jay Edmonds and, and uh, the folks that work with him who really try to look out 100 years. Again, these are guidelines for thinking about the scale of the problem and the nature of the technology that is, in fact, required to deal with it. So basically what the New York State approach has is two activities. One was a visioning activity that was intended to do really several things. The first was, is the 80 by 50 goal a reasonable and plausible goal? Uh, it, what are the sizes of the change? And we tried to present this, though working with the various technical working groups, they'd love to say that this is our plan for the future, but what we're really trying to do is provide context. The council and its working groups, uh, they've got a set of working groups that look at the various sectors. They're the ones that are putting together the strategy. And they're also supported by the economics, which Paul has quite rightly has pointed out is quite important, particularly in the near term. And there's a standard approach that we know in terms of developing abatement cost curves, where you understand what sort of carbon emission reduction you can get for particular prices. So the visioning approach. What we did is we actually looked at the various economic sectors and we postulated a distribution of carbon dioxide emissions amongst those sectors. Then we put together a series of technology strategies, again, not as a plan, but in order to set the scale and scope for the problem. And in essence, this is kind of a backcasting approach where what you're doing is you're saying, okay, if you want to achieve this distribution of carbon emissions amongst the various economically important sectors of the economy, what does it take to get you there? What are the kinds of decisions that you need to make? And I think, at least for this process, it avoids the compounding scenario problem. So New York State carbon dioxide emissions, like most carbon dioxide emissions, are due to combustion. Just a little bit of the facts and data relative to uh, 
Uh, relative to natural, natural gas per unit of energy, coal generates more than twice as much um, carbon dioxide, oil, 70 percent more. Um, nuclear renewables are in fact important. And that we really talk about two carriers of energy. These are carriers in the sense that it can be moved from place to place. But these are also the places where we talk about storage. We talk about storage of, of energy in batteries. We talk about storage of energy in hydrogen. But they really are carriers of energy. So just a quick thing. This is actually a slide I took from the presentation I gave last time. I think the important point here, you can see China, India. This is, these are on much larger scales than we're going to talk about. But the various strategies depend a great deal on what the underlying starting point is. And rather than going into the details of this, let's talk about the New York uh, situation. This is the current emissions, our 2007 emissions of carbon dioxide measured in millions of metric tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, our business as usual, our notional business as usual, uh, has an increase of uh, uh, roughly 40 percent over this period of time. It's interesting to note, to, to Paul's previous point, that in 1990, the emissions were, in fact, 10 percent larger. This is the export of the industrial base of the state of New York overseas. Uh, this is not necessarily the best way to go about carbon emissions, because it's really a false result. But, uh, and there is a big debate inside of, the, uh, inside of the community as to how do you measure the implicit carbon inside of your imports. The New York plan is not explicit with respect to that. And I think it's going to be a challenge for everyone who's worried about regional emissions uh, to worry about this along the run. This is something that the Europeans have been concerned for a long period of time. I've highlighted transportation here. Uh, actually, New York State looks very much like a Western European nation or Japan with the large amount of the emissions, in fact, coming from the transportation sector uh, in this process. So what we did is we put together three scenarios in order to guide the council as they thought about this problem. And I think they illustrate come up some of the issues. The yellow scenario is what I call a conventional wisdom. Renewables and efficiency can kind of solve the problem. Um, and we have, and we can debate about whether we've exploited the renewables completely. But the important point is that that combination gets us most of the way to 2050 and also highlights the issues associated with the transportation scenario. Then we have two other scenarios that uh, focus on transportation and on the building sector as a path going forward. The first, as we'll see, focuses on hydrogen as an energy carrier, and the latter focuses on electricity as an energy carrier. And as we told the people who were uh, in the working groups in a, in a phone call just, a, I think, just last week, Again, these are not prescriptions. You may, this is like a basis set. You can choose elements of each of these and combine them together. But we wanted to illustrate is that this is a big problem, and the associated infrastructure that goes along with it and the policies to support it need to be scaled to the size of the challenge. So basically, we started off with the building sector. You can see efficiency improvements here. And on top of that, we see f fuel conversion. And we also said that locally generated renewables which should, in fact, be part of the building sector. Now, the building sector includes uh, other things we've lumped in here, things like data centers and kind of district approaches along the way. But you can see that these changes we have here make a tremendous change in the residential, uh, in the residential emissions of carbon dioxide. Residences, like automobiles, are a diffuse source of emissions. Those are the hardest to control. And this illustrates one of the principles that comes out of almost every mitigation strategy is the increased electrification because of the, let's see, the, the facility of decarbonizing centrally generated electricity. Uh, I say facility advisedly uh, in, that, in that standpoint. So if we go to the industrial case, a little bit more difficult here, uh, natural gas efficiency, movements to electricity, and the balance to grid, all the solids, all the coal to natural gas, only a modest amount to, uh, to electricity. There may be some more that we can do in this area, but notice we're already halfway to the goal and may need to do that. But I think the, uh, 
uh, the question of, of how your industrial sector evolves, and I'll come back and talk about that in a moment, is just as important as the targets that you set for its allocation of carbon dioxide at a distant time in the future. Uh, transportation is the big dog. This is, this is 50 percent of heavy duty vehicles to intermodal. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, conventional vehicles at 37 miles per gallon, hybrid electrics, plug-in hybrid electrics, 30 percent improvement in efficiency in aviation. These are substantial. They are substantial reductions, but already you're over the goal as a result of the transportation sector as well. So the challenge we had in the subsequent elements were, in fact, to focus on that. Uh, so we've been pushing things to the electric sector. Uh, in fact, a large amount of, uh, we've improved a lot in terms of overall efficiency, but essentially so far we've pushed 182,000 gigawatts, almost 80 percent of the current demand to the electric sector as a result of this. And you can see that basically we have, in this scenario, all CCS, all of these losses are losses from CCS. This is a nominal 95 percent effectiveness of the fully integrated carbon dioxide system. Carbon, carbon capture and storage, yes, I have the IPCC correct talk. Um, so at any rate, carbon dioxide capture and storage is an important feature. Jim Dooley's done a series of papers that the difference between 95 percent capture and storage efficiency as opposed to 99 percent is actually fairly dramatic, and I think it points to the importance of the efficiency of that technology. Um, so and the question is, how do you meet that demand? In this scenario, what we've done is we've moved uh, uh, both, both coal and natural gas to CCS. Uh, there is a solar component, which is 100,000 gigawatt hours of electricity which just to calibrate at current, roughly current efficiencies, this is 1 percent of the land area of the state of New York. So this, I, I, I will defend this as an aggressive goal. Uh, you can see the increase of wind by a factor of 50 in this, and no change in the nuclear, which is also part of the conventional wisdom, is that you really don't need to add to the nuclear, power, nuclear fleet in order to be able to do this. So finally, uh, I, there's a little bit of other. Uh, this number includes things like fugitive methane emissions, reduction of the high uh, uh, greenhouse warming gases through this whole process. This was not done in detail, but as you can see, the comparison of this number and that number highlights the point that as you press your target down, the overall um, requirement for addressing all small sources goes up. This is part of the, this is what they've discovered in in California, in the Southern California Air Quality Board, where they reduced the point sources, they reduced emissions, and then finally they ended up banning lighter fluid as one of the sources of, of volatile organic hydrocarbons that was in fact leading to pollution. So these diffuse sources at small levels, which aren't large at the beginning, in fact become increasingly important as time goes on. So basically, it doesn't meet the goal. It eliminates all current fossil fuel combustion for electricity, moving all of that to CCS, whether that's with retrofit or new plants. On this time scale, it's, we took it as being new plants. It does not make heavy use of biomass or nuclear in this particular scenario, calls for a massive deployment of wind and solar, and this demand on the grid is important. And just to calibrate a little bit on the grid, the most important transmission line in the state of York runs north-south along the champlain Hudson Valley. There are still parts of that distribution system where the wires are hung on wood. This is an old and decrepit system, and we're going to place even greater demands on it under those circumstances. So basically, this deep blue scenario is our first goal-reaching scenario. And what we said, well, let's make the challenge for the building sector. Let's make it zero carbon emitting. And basically, this is electrification and pushes 108,000 gigawatts to the grid. Again, 20 percent efficiency, 50 percent to electricity. Uh, biofuels are part of that. For this particular approach, we assumed that biofuels were carbon neutral, which is not necessarily the case. Uh, commercial improvements at 30 percent and all natural gas to liquids um, to electricity with 30 percent of those electric needs met locally. That's the, that's the scenario. So a big challenge for that set of folks there. 
Industrial case, uh, we moved as much of the natural gid and liquids to the grid, solid fuel to natural gas as the yellow scenario, and it turns out that petrochemicals and asphalt end up being 70% uh, of the result associated with this. The other uses of fossil fuels and fossil fuel related material and a modest amount of movement to the grid itself. Uh, and then transportation, this was the big place, high, high uh, uh, heavy duty vehicles, 45% biofuel, 55% diesel, uh, aviation, 45% of that from biojet, um, the lightweight vehicles 100% at 65 mile per gallon equivalent, and the hydrogen pro production was done with nuclear pants with a 50,000 gigawatt hour equivalent for that particular analysis. So nothing really going to the grid, really going to hydrogen here. Electricity, the total electric demand is about the same as the yellow scenario, 410,000 gigawatts. There are the emissions, let's see how that is in fact met. Here you can see a growth in nuclear. This is over and above the growth in nuclear associated with the generation of hydrogen. You can see wind, hydro, solar is roughly the same thing, and all with natural gas on, uh, on, uh, with CCS. Again, and much of the losses are there. Commercial and resident structures have been taken to zero. Electrification, efficiency, local generation. I think it's a real challenge to think about how local generation is going to play and a heavier reliance on biofuel. Uh, the electrical production is further, further electrified and here we've used hydrogen as the energy carrier and only a modest amount of nuclear has been added in this mix. So the next one is, and so the ultraviolet scenario focused on electricity as the alternative it's got the same basic emissions as the deep blue scenario, and I apologize for, those, for the significance of these digits uh, along the way. I, we don't pretend to know them this way, but, uh, uh, but basically uh, the aviation sector and the heavy duty vehicles are the same. Lightweight vehicles is 100% pl plug-in hybrid electric. Again, that's not saying that we don't go to electric vehicles and the whole process along here. These are illustrative paths trying to place bounds on the nature of, of the, of the and nature and scale of the changes that in fact are required and the transportation moves an additional almost 39,000 gigawatt hours to the grid. And again, electricity dominated by, um, uh, again, by the uh, fugitive emissions from the capture process and you can see we've made a tremendous effect here and we're kind of down to 55 million metric tons. I mean, at the level we're doing it, these are, these are close enough for government work or, this, in this case, state of, work, state of New York work. So let's, let's look at these a little bit. Oh, finally, this is uh, that uh, demand. One of the critical things here is that you see far less of the electricity sector being met through fossil fuel combustion with carbon dioxide capture and storage and a corresponding incredibly large increase in the generation of energy from the nuclear sector. Again, solar and wind we saturated in the first scenario. So the ultraviolet scenario, again, move to plug-in hybrids, liquid fuel, any liquid fuel me is met by ethanol in this particular case, not because I'm partial to ethanol in anything but a wine glass or a beer stein but simply because it illustrates that we're going to use part of the limited biomass resource in the state of New York in order to do that. And nuclear power has become a major player in the process. So here are the scenarios all tied together. I think that the key thing is as you look out here, transportation and industrial kind of dominate the emissions. And, and in fact, most of the other is in fact tied to industrial production. It's just that it's not by, by combustion itself. Uh, CCS and nuclear are key to the reductions in the, in the nuclear sector. Again, you see what the emissions would be in the future demand here if it were not for, uh, for using CCS. And uh, we have, as I've said before, assumed that biofuels are carbon neutral. Uh, I didn't have a chance to go through it in time, but the New York, state of New York has just issued their biofuels roadmap uh, uh, just this past week, and we're going to go back and look at that. As I allude to earlier, how you use biomass is in fact an important policy decision in the way in which you choose to go forward. It really is an important resource. 
whether you're going to use that with low temperature processes or high temperature processes, whether you're going to use it for electricity or you're going to use it for transportation fuels or you're going to use it for process heat and combined heat and power. These are important decisions and the resource is finite enough that it is in fact a decision. It's not that there's enough to go around. So the conclusion we came to was this is an ambitious goal. Um, it in fact, however, we think it can, can be met, but it requires investments in, in both the energy systems and the infrastructures in order to drive it. Efficiency we've made, I think, are reasonable efficiency assumptions uh, associated with these. They kind of compound in the system, but the combination of efficiency and renewables are insufficient. The, the switch to electricity generation is important. Uh, carbon dioxide capture and storage, sorry Paul, uh, will in fact be important. This is a, a, this is a problem we should have been working more intensively on a decade ago and we're still going relatively slowly relative to the scale over which these things in fact are going to be needed. Uh, development and redevelopment based on smart growth principles are one of the principal ways we use to reduce the vehicle mile traveled under the circumstances. And I think it's fairly clear that when you start looking at the infrastructure required, either at the grid or at the power plants, kind of the incremental short planning approach is just is not going to get you there. So I think looking ahead to what the challenge that the council has is made up of a variety of points. There are big decisions and I think they have to make them relatively early. This whole question about how one chooses to decarbonize central generation is going to be the challenge that any state or any region is going to face as they go through the process. Some places have an abundance of renewables. Uh, I, my, my favorite of this is Norway, who could make even more money if they simply exported all their hydro uh, to places like Sweden and places with green certificates under those circumstances. New York and the East Coast is not endowed with a renewable resource that will in fact allow it to meet the challenge, at least as far as we did this. The reliability and the capacity of the grid becomes increasingly important. Just for reference, the average customer on the electric grid in the United States suffers at six hours of interrupted power in the course of a year. In Japan, it's six minutes. Okay? So reliability is in fact an issue. Uh, we have a complicated regulatory environment in the, in the uh, Northeast, even in the Northwest. There are large numbers of utilities. Some are publicly owned, some are privately owned how they in fact interact and work as a system, it makes it, it sometimes is absolutely amazing that uh, the National Academy of Engineering identified the grid as one of the greatest accomplishments of the, of the 20th century. It is in fact, it is the world's largest machine, but certainly in this country, we have a long way to go in order to support the increased demand. And then this question of biomass that I talked about. Uh, one point that we made <coughs> and I think this reflects the desire for jobs, and you really can't decouple that. We did make an assumption of an increasing industrial base counter to what's happened over the last 20 years in the state of New York. Uh, electrification is, in fact, I think far more compatible with the technologies of the 21st century information technology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology. I think we need to look into the, into the, the points and beyond that. But this was not a no growth strategy for New York, New York State in terms of industrialization, industrialization and production of widgets. We did restrict this and say that all of the renewable energy sources needed to come from within the state. Now, one can import from Quebec, one can import from a variety of places. The state of New York constrained it this way, again, because of the jobs driver. Ultimately, they're going to have to look at how the state cooperates with its neighbors, how it's, whether it's going to become a net importer of, of green energy or CCS from the mid, CCS related uh, electricity production from the Midwest. But that's a decision that they need to have. And we outlined how would the state itself do this process. And I think those aggressive goals for renewables, every gigawatt hour that you don't get out of that process, you've got to find from some other way. And uh, uh, achievement of those goals is in fact critical. And when one looks at 
wind and solar. There are, for wind, there are issues of siting. There are issues of intermittency that we hope to be able to solve with things like storage. In the case of solar, I think this puts the premium on, on the technology that can be improved efficiency, not only in terms of the electrical conversion efficiency, but the production of the cells themselves. Um, I read just recently that it's only been in the last few years where we've put more silicon into photocells than we've put into computers. We still make silicon-based photocells like we make computers. If we're going to succeed with this vision, we need to be able, able to make it more like toilet paper or newsprint. That's the scale and size that you have to be able to do this. This is not a, uh, a, a custom electronics business. This is a high volume production business. And as we look to the, to the materials and we look to the processes that are in fact going to go forward, it's going to be a challenge. This is also in fact going to be, I think, facilitated by storage. Uh, the intermittency issues associated with solar, we're about to put 37 megawatts of, of uh, solar on our site, covers 200 acres, just to calibrate a little bit. And the question of whether you put inverters on each one of these and couple them directly to the grid or you run the direct current into, into storage batteries, that transition will change the nature of solar on the grid and in fact I think will increase its, its nominal penetration, not that that means the state of New York is going to put 2% um, of its uh, land into, into solar cells, but more importantly because it changes the reliability profile and the ability to respond to the eventual demand associated with, uh, with, with the growing electricity demand. So I think I've left some time for questions. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I think there are two parts, two, two parts to that question. Um, I, I think that it's not only mobilizing, but it's maintaining the political will. I mean, there are conversations in California right now about backing away from their greenhouse plan that's going forward for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and I think, I think that we kind of run hot and cold on things. And I think ultimately um, it is going to be the commitment to the infrastructure that makes this easier that's going to be the critical part of this. The infrastructure provides job, but it also provides a simpler means to the market. So a smart grid allows you to do local renewable energy generation. You can do it on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, <coughs> I don't know whether this is the right analogy, but in the United States, the creation of the interstate highway system really changed the way transportation operates. It got rid of the railroads to a large extent. It created the suburbs and a lot of the driving patterns that we have. Now, those aren't necessarily good things uh, along the way, but the fact of the matter is it was the infrastructure that allowed that, in fact, to take place. And what I think we need to do is we need to think about those infrastructure investments that facilitate this. Uh, if that's a, a ability to be able to move carbon dioxide around from place to place. I mean, we have 3,000 miles of carbon dioxide carrying pipeline in the United States already supporting enhanced oil. That's what it's required, then that's important. If improving the grid, which I think is one of the most important ones, I think is important. And then there's the research infrastructure. The de decreasing cost of, of stationary storage, I think is going to be a game changer in terms of renewables. So I think it's going to be a hard haul. Um, it's got to be kind of a Cold War approach on steroids in order to maintain this over the 50 or 60 years that's in fact required. Right. Right. A lot of these decisions embodied in there are private sector decisions. Yes. What are going to be the behavioral changes and policy drivers that would come out in these scenarios? Yeah. I, this, is, this is the primary discussion that's taking place in the working groups right now. 
And I think that um, I, I, I like to answer the behavioral question in, in, in kind of two ways. Um, first of all, I think there are concrete policies about siting and placing of resources that, in fact, will facilitate this. If, you know, we're, Indian Point is a big problem in West, just in the north part of Westchester County because of the way in which it, it gets rid of its waste heat. It just kind of dumps it into the Hudson. So how we think about siting, where you site them, completes, puts in place for those people who are going to count on the central generators, gives them a cushion and an opportunity in order to be able to take the kind of risks associated with this. The other one is that I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of think globally and act locally. But the fact of the matter is that it's very difficult for any one individual in this room to make a set of personal decisions that's going to make the impact of large-scale infrastructure. You can, but um, I, think it's, I think it's Heidegger talks about the readiness to hand of technology, where he says, you know, in the hands of a skilled carpenter, the hammer is indistinguishable from the act of hammering. So the extent to which these efficiencies are built into the infrastructure will facilitate people doing the right thing in an appropriate way along the way. You know, it's district heating. If district heating is in fact put in and people are comfortable, district heating saves a huge amount of energy with respect to that process. So my sense is that we want to have a very careful balance as we promote behavior that it's policy stability, it's creating a clear uh, opportunity for people who are willing to make the large investments that are there and I think making it easier for people to do the right thing along the way is in fact important. Right. 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 They're the eigenvectors, you know, in, in, in this process. You may do. You may do a. You may do a solution that. And this is what we try to tell the transportation group. You say, look, people talk about hydrogen. People talk about electricity. And uh, we used up in both of those scenarios most of the biomass in the state that could went to ethanol or to aviation fuel. So, so th those are the two energy carriers that you've got. And so what we wanted to do was to give them a fairly complete representation of what the nature of the investment and the scale of change that was required in order to be able to do either one of the two. Uh, uh, building two infrastructures may also be problematic in this, but, that, but that's another issue. So you, so you weren't really taking a stand. We weren't taking a stand. What we're trying to do is we're trying to illustrate the choices. That's why we did the same thing with CCS, a little bit of natural gas in one, more coal in the other kind of trying to understand how those trade-offs ought to do. And we're in the process of putting together a toy model that they can play. Because ultimately, these working groups are going to go off and think about how they're going to achieve these things themselves, but it's all got to get integrated together back along the way. And the last thing you need is people tossing more over the transom to one sector or the other, just the same way we toss carbon emissions offshore. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Right. 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 What is what is the incentivization for them to invest in nuclear power, for example, today? There's none. Um. Well, I think they're. Why would they take that risk? I think they're two questions associated with that. One is they do not believe in the projected increase for demand. Uh, if you look at progress energy, for example, they've gone through a large period of time where their demand has grown in the southeast. Um, progress has bought time in peaking with natural gas, but ultimately they've had to make a decision whether they're going to go with coal or whether they're going to in fact go to nuclear. So I think um, there, the, the question of whether the uh, independent power producers are going to make this decision is in fact probably going to be generated primarily by the demands 
from the distributors along the way that are going to seek the increased power. Uh, and so everyone's trying to figure out how to make this less expensive. I mean, that's the push to small nukes is exactly that, so that you're not doing a $6 billion investment, you're doing a under billion dollar investment and all the capital things that go along with it. The other one is that um, I think the, the independent power producers are going to be looking at things like demand response and how you can meet peak in other ways. And, and demand response is kind of cool. You go in and you take a big block of apartment buildings and you shut everybody, you know, alternate people off for five minutes along the way. You can, in fact, get a huge decrease in the, in the peaking power associated with that. It is a zero cost uh, spinning reserve of, of power. Additionally, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are shown to be great at kind of filling in the gap. Uh, that exists in the, in, the da in the diurnal demand curve. As those two things become more mature, the long-term, basically you're going to flatten the demand curve, and these big resources are in fact going to be more and more cost competitive because they can run all the time. The baseload power is the cheapest along the way, and I think it's going to drive to baseload power uh, through the process. That's my, that's my prediction at this stage. Yes. Uh, you you emphasize this uh, need to uh, subscribe to get access to the resources, the infrastructure for whatever scenario. Right. Hydrogen energy, electricity, and so forth. Right. But could you describe how we implement this in such a way that uh, everybody uh, becomes an entrepreneur in making this successful? Right. Yeah. Uh, and the experiment has been done, the economic experiment has been done over in Europe, in the case of Germany, yeah. where in fact they eliminated that differential and they actually eliminated any cap, right? This is cap right. the maximum amount of uh, renewables that could go right. into the grid. Right. Right. So that incentivized on the top. Right. Uh, they could compete against the yeah. Right. Uh, and other countries didn't do that. Right. Europe, yeah. The United States and other countries have larger wind resources and uh, right. are not great producers of wind, not I, 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 I think that's a good point. I, I think, I, right now, I, I won't speak for German utilities. There's a little bit more central planning from the control from the state than there is in the United States. I know when I go and talk to an electric utility and I ask them, let's say, we'll, we'll take an example on the side, I ask them about CCS or demand response. Their first response to me is, we do not want a single digit serial number of anything because they can't predict the way in which the process goes forward. So we're in an experimental time right now where we're proving things along the way. There are experiments going on in the United States as a result of the stimulus funds, which <coughs> I think are going to lay the groundwork for this. In, um, in the AEP service area, part of their uh, implementation fund is designed to allow individual compute com uh, consumers to bid into the power market. They say, for this, I'm only willing to pay this amount, and so their dishwasher or whatever will not start till it reaches that particular point. I think the question of how you empower consumers in this is an open issue along the way. And, and as you think about Germany, remember that they have a renewable infrastructure that they paid for at roughly four times the market rate. I mean, that Germany has this high penetration is a huge subsidy of resources that allows them, in fact, to be able to do that experiment. I think they've worn out the world's stomach for being able to, to make that scale of, of subsidy in these things. I mean, we're still doing it. We, we subsidize ethanol right now to the tune of $100 a ton carbon equivalent. Uh, but I don't think people think about it that way. So I think that as time goes forward, we need an empowerment all through the grid, all the way down to the consumer level. The kinds of things that are being done in Germany, people are watching very closely. And I think there are other experiments that are going to make that happen. Um, I, I would have been happier had they started 10 years ago 
Um, and some, in fact, did. There are, there are demand response experiments that have been done in the Pacific Northwest. But um, right now, we have to try many things, and we have to learn from the experience. Because I do not know a single distribution-based electrical company that does not believe that maintaining customer service is the single most important thing that they do. And anything that brings their reliability into question, whether it's a new technology or it's a new billing strategy or anything along that way, is considered to be a huge threat. AEP and LIPA may be experimenters, but trust me, Con Ed is not a big experimenter in this area. And if I had New York City as one of my principal customers, I'd be risk averse too. And so I think what we have to do is we have to run the experiments. We have to do the demonstrations. We have to make sure that we extract the most knowledge out of the, out of the limited things that are going on right now in order to be able to move it. Because our investments are roughly two orders of magnitude smaller than what, in fact, will be need just, to get us, need just to get us through the next 20 years. So. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.